It's been seven years since the Arab Spring protests broke out in the Gulf monarchy of Bahrain, with thousands of demonstrators at the Pearl Roundabout in the capital, Manama, initially calling for reforms and eventually demanding the ruling royal family step down. Human rights groups say the Bahraini government continues to violently crack down on dissent and lock up political prisoners. So what's the future for the country's protesters? Joining me to discuss this is Maria Malkawaja, a Bahraini activist in exile and advisor to the Gulf Center for Human Rights, who's been sentenced to prison in absentia by the Bahraini authorities and whose father is currently serving a life sentence there and has been called a prisoner of conscience by Amnesty International. Mariam, thanks for coming on up front. Um, you called the February 2011 uprising in Bahrain an inconvenient revolution for the Arab world and for the international community. What did you mean by that? Well, what I meant is that because of Bahrain's geopolitical importance being, you know, between Saudi Arabia and Iran and hosting the Fifth Fleet and now also a base for the United Kingdom, there are a lot of interests that uh, are based in Bahrain, wherein, you know, when we took to the streets in 2011, we knew that we weren't just up against the Bahraini government, but rather the six GCC countries plus their allies, the United Kingdom and the United States. And I think to the most part, we've been proven correct in that. You know, the United Kingdom and the United States continue to sell arms to the Bahraini government, and they continue to some extent to prop up the monarchy in Bahrain as well. So the deck is stacked against you. When you were on this show two years ago in 2016, you said you wouldn't call the Bahraini Arab Spring protests a, quote, failed uprising. Uh, you said change would happen, and it would happen either through a very violent situation coming about because of the repression or international pressure forcing the government to, quote, do the right thing. Neither of those things have happened in the intervening period. Do you now accept, whether you like it or not, it has been a failure, the uprising? No, I don't, because if you look at Wednesday, the 14th of February, was the seventh year anniversary of the Bahrain uprising. And the amount of protests that happened around the country, I think, is even more evidence that the people of Bahrain will continue to protest um, until they reach their you know, demands for civil and political rights. That being said, because of the nature of the situation in the region, but also internationally, of course, it's going to take time. When I said that you know, there's going to be a path of violence or a path of reform, that's still a path we're on. Bahrain is best described as a pressure cooker, because things will turn, um, you know, more violent if we continue down this path. But there is still an opportunity for reforms. It's just about whether that international pressure happens or not. And just to be clear, for the sake of our viewers, you've been accused by the Bahraini government, you and your family, of being violent people, supporters of terrorists, etc. All sorts of accusations thrown against you, charges thrown against you. What is your position on violence? I believe in nonviolence as a methodology for change, political and social change. Uh, let me put it this way: even when when I was being assaulted by four police officers in the airport in Bahrain during my arrest, I did not lift a finger to defend myself. So even when I'm being attacked, I believe that nonviolence is a way of regaining control of the situation and not being reactive. And you mentioned a demand for civil and political rights going on right now on the anniversary of the revolution of the protests this week. Just to be clear again, what are the goals of the protesters in Bahrain? Is it just political reform, more freedom, more rights? Or is it a revolution against the monarchy, a regime change? Well, as you stated in the beginning, when people took to the streets, it was about the king fulfilling the promises that he made in 2001, which was a constitutional monarchy. Nothing that has happened since then has led us to a path of constitutional monarchy. On the contrary, he unilaterally changed the constitution, placed himself above the constitution, and gave us a parliament that has no legislative or monitoring powers. And so when people took to the streets, they were just demanding that he fulfill his promises. It was after they started shooting and killing unarmed protesters that the demand shifted from being just about the constitution to demanding the stepping down of the ruling family. The Bahraini say, the authorities say, we offered reforms in 2011, we offered reforms again in 2014, the opposition boycotted any kind of elections or participation in the political process. It's the opposition who walked away from dialogue, from reform, from working together. I mean, all you have to do is look at the facts on the ground to know that there's absolutely no truth in that. First of all, Al-Wafaq and Wad have been disbanded, the largest two opposition societies in the country. We have a parliamentary election coming up later this year with no opposition to run in the elections. But even let's talk about the elections themselves. The gerrymandering in Bahrain puts even Texas to shame, wherein the opposition can receive up to 60 percent of the vote, but only 18 out of 40 seats in parliament. And those are all fair points. Just on 2014, was it, looking back, with the benefit of hindsight, was it a mistake for the opposition to have boycotted elections? 
So I'm not a politician myself, but I do understand that, you know, when, when Al-Wafaq and when Wa'ad and so on came out and said that they were not going to participate in the elections, to me it makes sense because if they had participated, they would have lost complete credibility uh, amongst the communities that they're supposed to serve. They would have lost com complete um, credibility amongst the people of Bahrain. But even taking it beyond that, for them to take part in an election that was a sham, that would have only served to, you know, give the government the legitimacy it was seeking internationally. You mentioned that the Bahraini people who have been protesting against the government, demonstrating against the government, are not just up against a ruling royal family, but up against the United States government, which supports uh, that ruling uh, government. Um, has the election of Donald Trump as president of the U.S. Uh, given you cause for optimism or pessimism? Has it made things better or worse for the people of Bahrain? The situation has definitely gotten, gotten worse. I mean, when we're looking at in 2017 in May, 48 hours after President Trump met with the King of Bahrain and said there will no longer be a strain on U.S.-Bahrain relations, um, five people were killed, extrajudicially killed, and up to 300 people were arrested on the same day. That's more than we had even in 2011. But on the other hand, the Gulf monarchies love President Trump. And so he has a lot more sway with them than Obama did, which means that he can also influence the situation in ways that the Obama administration could not. But what evidence is there that he wants to influence the situation in a way that you would support? That is exactly the question. There is an understanding that there needs to be reform in Bahrain, that the situation has continued to deteriorate, whether we're looking at the number of political prisoners, whether we're looking at the use of torture uh, by the military now, as well as the Ministry of Interior, um, and so on. So uh, there is that understanding. The question is, how do you build policy behind Behind that understanding. Um, many people who look uh, at the Middle East today, look at the region, uh, they see proxy wars being fought everywhere. And the argument is that a lot of what goes on in the Middle East is basically Saudi Arabia versus Iran, whether it's in Yemen, whether it's in Syria, whether it's in Bahrain. And a lot of people uh, think, and the Bahraini government claims, that the protests in Bahrain are driven by Iran. It's all about Iranian sponsorship, Iranian involvement, Iranian provocation. You have a Shia majority country with a minority Sunni ruling family, and Iran is basically stirring up the hornet's nest there. What do you say to them? Well, I think, you know, it's you, all you have to do is look at Bahraini history to understand that. The Bahraini ruling family has been trying to paintbrush the opposition as anything that is perceived as a threat du jour. So, for example, you know, to begin with, we were all Nasser socialists, then we all became communists, then we all became Iranian agents, and now we're terrorists, Iranian agents, and now apparently also Qatari agents as well. Um, but I think Ir Iran getting involved in Bahrain is a self-fulfilling prophecy. The more heavy-handed the crackdown is, the more Iran speaks out saying that there's oppression and torture in Bahrain, and the more there's a failure from the West to do so, uh, the more the Bahraini people are going to, you know, find themselves in a position where they don't see any other way out or any other ally than Iran. Is it the best thing for Bahrain? Of course it's not. Well, the Bahraini government say it's a cause of violence. They point to November of last year when one of their main oil pipelines, they say there was an explosion caused by, quote, terrorist sabotage linked to Iran. Well, Iran, of course, the, the Iranians Bahraini, deny it, obviously. The Bahraini government has been making a lot of claims for a very long time, way beyond, you know, 2011. They've been talking about many terrorist cells. Um, now, the question is, why is it that the Bahraini government refuses to allow any form of independent investigation to back up their claims? That's where I place the question mark. I'm not saying it's not happening at all. I don't know if it is, because I don't have access to that information. How much of this is sectarian? You've said on the record in the past, you've called Bahrain a semi-apartheid regime uh, because of its de discrimination against Shias there. You've attacked the Bahraini military and compared some of its rhetoric to ISIL's uh, rhetoric. The Bahraini government says, that's absurd. We're one of the most secular liberal governments in the region. When you're looking at the situation in Bahrain from a sectarian viewpoint, the sectarian, uh, you know, language that's being used, the discourse is coming from the government. The Basically, sectarianism is a tool that's being used to divide and conquer. That's the whole purpose of it. Have they been successful in actually creating sectarian violence in the country? No, they have not, because the Bahraini people generally from, you know, its origin have always been a very peaceful, very friendly society, the Sunnis and Shias alike. You're not just a human rights activist. You're someone who's actually personally deeply affected by all of this. Your father is currently serving a life sentence in Bahrain uh, after a trial that a lot of human rights groups criticized as unfair, unjust. He's been on hunger strikes. Uh, you and your sister both had to leave Bahrain after being detained and charged with crimes there. Uh, and you've basically been campaigning on the issue of Bahrain and for your family and for others, I think since, what, the age of 22? Earlier even, yes. How hard is it to keep carrying on like this when the odds are clearly so stacked against you? 
Well, I think, you know, change is going to come in some, just a matter of time. Given the economic shift that's happening, the climate change and the way that it's going to affect the Middle East, um, and all of these changes that we're witnessing right now, plus, you know, the changes happening in Saudi Arabia at the current, uh, the current time, I think it is, it's becoming more and more evident that it's just a matter of time before things change. It's just about how that change is going to come about. And I really hope that it's not going to be by everything exploding into violence where we can no Getting longer worse before it gets better. Exactly. Mariam El Khawaja, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Thank you. That's our show. Upfront will be back next week.